having me. Appreciate being here with FreeMind. Uh, like many uh, physician scientists my age, I won't say what that is, I was minted by the federal government. Uh, my, uh, I got a, as you heard, I had an undergrad degree in biochem and computer science from Berkeley, and that was fully funded by the state of California. I uh, have, a, it's, it's actually not doing much here. Well, it's doing something. I, it, okay. Uh, somehow it, it wants to be full, oh, there we go. Uh, my uh, Stanford MD and uh, master's in CS was, was half funded by the federal government. I was on a Harvard NIH Center grant at, at, uh, at MIT while I was chief resident of Mass General. So I think I, I leave this as an opening because I think, I believe that, that the private public partnership in the United States for research is going to save human civilization from devastating infectious disease. And the reason is, I am the CEO of a biotech company right across the bay called Flow Pharma, and we cannot get the ROI, the return on investment, to invest personally in the private space in infectious disease. And that's just the way it is. I mean, there's the money in biotech right now. It's cancer and CNS. That's it. That's where all the money's going. Immuno oncology and dementia, and how do we not have Alzheimer's anymore? And if you want to have a tuberculosis vaccine, forget it. It's not going to happen. So, so, uh, so it is critical that we work with the federal government. The United States government, I believe, is positioned the best government in the world for doing this because this private-public partnership enables the U.S. government with all its resources and understanding of these, these scientific problems to access all the talent that we have in the U.S. to move forward. So I think this is a very important thing, and I think Freemind has been very helpful to us. I'll give them a plug there. We have a very unique... Um, Pe uh, peptide vaccine platform. This is a platform technology. It's patented. It uses adjuvanted microspheres to produce an immune response to peptides, causing killer T cell expansion to kill infected cells. We use this for applications in cancer and immune oncology, which, as I mentioned, is a fundable area, and also for infectious disease, focusing on filovirus. Uh, the other interesting thing about this, this product is that, uh, under development, is it's room temperature stable dry powder. Uh, and it can be delivered nasally, and, and this is a programmable platform, so we can very rapidly drop peptides into this, and this creates a scenario where we can um, very rapidly, uh, th theoretically, deal with a new threat. So this is, uh, this meets some of the requirements uh, that DITRA has outlined in its, uh, and BARDA has outlined in their quest for, uh, uh, for a threat direction focused uh, 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 tools for dealing with uh, potential uh, chemical, biological threats. I'm just seeing a little thing. I'm doing. So, I made this slide busy on purpose. Uh, you're going to file a grant for the federal government. What do you do? We've well, got to find a grant, which is not always so easy. You've heard about the OTA. OTA is very interesting. Uh, there's also obviously broad agency announcements. There are lots of these things. They're spread across different agencies. Um, uh, help in that. FreeMind, of course, provide. Uh, by the way, I'm not a consultant to FreeMind. I had an Apple turnover this morning. That's the only thing they've given me. Uh, uh, I brought my own ticket here, so I'm, I'm speaking from the heart when I say they're very good. Uh, they can help you find a grant, and, and if you have a STTR application which requires a partnership, you've got to find a partner. Uh, we work with, we don't have our own BSL-4 laboratory, obviously, so we work in the filovirus space with the Galveston National Lab in, um, in, in La Jolla. We worked with, uh, sorry, in, in Galveston, Texas, and with uh, Alessandro Setti's uh, operation at La Jolla uh, 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 Immunology Institute for our STTR phase one. So you've got to find a partner. You've got to then, uh, you know, uh, make the submission. Well, you've got, you've got officers of your company. You've got a CFO. You've got a lawyer. You've got scientists. You've got manufacturers. All these people have to somehow be rallied to do something they don't really want to do, which is write some section of this thing. And maybe two people write one section, and they, maybe they didn't do it correctly. They've got to redo it. So this, this is not a, you know, it's not a trivial task to put these things together. And you've got to, of course, then interact with the government agency, including your contracting officer, to understand you know, uh, uh, how, this, how this needs to go forward. And I think that the, the thing that often gets missed in all this is that you have to have project management. You can't just do this uh, without a project manager on the project. It has to be internal uh, as a full FTE, or I think the FreeMind guys do a great job here because they do the project management for you. They will manage this whole project internally and externally to make sure everybody does their homework, which is really, I think, very, very critical. The other problem is once you get the grant, you got to manage the grant. And I tell you, you know, I, um, I met with a lot of people at the NIH and other federal agencies over the years, and these are very good people. They're highly trained. They're dedicated. They work very hard. And, you know, um, uh, you need to respect them. And I think if you get one of these grants, you really want to execute on it like it was a high-priority item. You don't want to say, well, 
we got this partnership with Merck, we're gonna do that first, and then we'll do that. You don't want, no, that's, that's not what you wanna be doing. You wanna be treating these government grants for what they are. They are focused requests for help in mission critical areas for the government with some very competent people behind them that you're working with, and you wanna treat them with respect and you wanna execute on time and on budget to the best that you can and keep the communication channels open. You don't wanna just sort of set this aside and that managing the process is, is tricky because you gotta have the reporting requirement and, and you know, this, if we work with the Army, and it's kinda like, okay, are you in the go lane or the no-go lane? We don't wanna hear some paragraph and read, through, no, it's not, the first line is on time, on budget. Second thing is, what you do, it's gotta be staccato, it's gotta be accurate, it's gotta be complete, and it's gotta be carefully thought out. You just can't punch these things out without, without some thought. When you're done, you gotta file with, with, uh, with uh, with DDIC, which is the Defense Technology Information Agency. And I mean, you know, this is a whole other complexity that isn't actually so easy to do. And so, and then, gosh, we're done. You gotta go to the funding cycle. SCTR, you go from phase one to phase two. If it's some other area like human testing, you may have to go to a different agency because the uh, uh, DITRA is not gonna probably fund human testing necessarily without getting money uh, involved from somewhere else. So again, the FreeMind guys have helped us. We had a. We, we have a SCTR phase one grant that we have that helped us with a phase two. We're gonna get that, fun, that's, uh, that's been essentially approved. The funding should come in this month or so. And we've had a very good interaction with them and with the federal government with their help. And so I think that this is not a go it alone kind of project. You need help and, and these guys are very good. And I just wanna re, revisit what I just said, which is you wanna find the relevant grant that best matches what you're gonna do. Uh, you want to be able to write this stuff correctly. I mean, I still can't write a specific aim section. I mean, I've written a lot of peer-reviewed journal articles. Uh, you know, oh, this is wrong. This is wrong. Well, we, we, good, uh, no, this is not an abstract. You got you know, so there's a whole thing to do in this that is not super obvious, and you need project management. And if you can't do it internally, and, and even I think medium-sized companies have a hard time with this because the project manager has to understand what, what the what the uh, what the goals are and if you're just you know well you know just do this thing and it's wrong it's the, the the free mind guys will give you a domain a domain knowledgeable expert who will understand what you need to do understand what has to be done and and, and physically reach out to people and make them do it <laughs> so it's a great service I actually don't charge enough i probably shouldn't have told them that today and uh, and don't hide in the laboratory okay you know you know, th this is this is human interaction. You know, go to the go to the BARDA meeting, meet some people, get one of these tech watch meetings, uh, and, and you know, and, and that's how these things move forward. Because you know, the application is just a bunch of writing, filling in some blanks, and there's probably thousands of them. So you want to be you want to be in front of people, and the United States government has many mechanisms for making that happen. So you don't have to hide out and not communicate. We have two projects in the filovirus space. Um, one is a, a vaccine, a prophylactic vaccine for Ebola. The other is a prophylactic vaccine for Marburg. Marburg is a, uh, a listed medical virus uh, countermeasure, a medical countermeasure uh, uh, pathogen because it's been weaponized and is uh, of concern for aerosol delivery to soldiers and also to civilian populations. We have a, we completed a phase one working with our partner, um, uh, Alessandro Setti and his team at the uh, La Jolla Institute of Immunology. And the phase two, again, we, uh, we, we uh, got conditional approval and have completed all the negotiations and funding that is, is imminent. We had a site visit from DITRA that went well and all's, all's good with that. And I have to really credit FreeMind for doing that. We have another grant out uh, that FreeMind helped us put together. The DOD has a longstanding um, uh, opportunity for breast cancer research. We're in that field. We're going to file a, a several grants in that, I think, and this is the first one. I'll talk a little bit about that, and again, this is another opportunity to uh, deal with another branch of the, of, the, of the military. Actually, this is an Army uh, activity, and, and Freemine was very helpful with that. Uh, let's talk just a little bit about Filovirus, and I want to talk about how our platform works. I'm not going to go into a whole bunch of detail with our company, but I think it's useful. I want to tell you a little bit about it because I think I want to, I want to explain to you why this was attractive to TechWatch, how we positioned it for TechWatch, and why you should go to TechWatch to do what you want to do. So foreign actors have weaponized Marburg for aerosol delivery. This is interesting because filovirus is typically not delivered by inhalation. So you may have noticed, you know, Merck got approval for an Ebola vaccine in the civilian population. Uh, typical transmission is by mucous membrane transmission, sexual contact, and inadvertent transmission where you, you touch a body fluid, you touch your eye, your mouth, and so on. 
Um, actually, uh, there's very little aerosol delivery probably in the civilian world. It's probably less than 5%, nobody knows for sure. But in the military context, it's going to be an aerosol exposure. You heard uh, Dr. Hahn talk about uh, measuring the uh, wobbles of artillery shells and be able to hear a hiss instead of a bang and realizing you were just exposed to an aerosol delivery of a potential biological agent. Uh, that, that's an aerosol delivery type mechanism where you're going to be inhaling the material. And it turns out that in non-human primate models, if you combine lung tissue with a filovirus antibody from a vaccine, and you give a lung delivery, you instantly kill the animal through rapid bleeding into the lung. And this, is a, this has been, been really pretty well characterized now. It's pretty scary. In fact, these animals die faster than placebo group because of this interaction with antibody, lung tissue, and virus. So the, uh, obviously, the government knows this. And uh, they also, we also said, hey, we have a peptide, vac we have a peptide vaccine. We do not uh, focus on antibody response. We get a T cell expansion event. It doesn't use antibodies as the primary mechanism of, or really as any mechanism of, of efficacy. So uh, we um, went, to, went to BARDA, to their big meeting, sought out some people, talked to them, got a tech watch set up, and, uh, and uh, talked to Lieutenant Colonel at the Fort Detrick and his team about this, and, and they were interested. And we ended up filing for a, uh, for a grant for SDTR phase one, which is, as, as uh, Dr. Han said, this is rapidly granted. We got funded very quickly. So within those time limits that he was talking about to do our first, our first work. I'm gonna talk a little bit about how our system works. Um, I'm not gonna belabor this in a great deal of detail, but uh, if you're gonna deliver a peptide vaccine, you have two problems you have to counter. One is that peptides are tiny and will not elicit an immune response by themselves. Second problem is you can't deliver, you don't wanna deliver two different peptide sequences to the same antigen presenting cell. They will compete and they will not properly deliver. This is a big problem because you'd like to deliver lots of peptides because you don't know which one is gonna be critical on the target cell and you really can't, there's a penalty to doing that. Uh, and the penalty is illustrated here. This is from our laboratory. We took a um, blood from a patient who had a tetanus vaccine uh, shot, a successful tetanus immunization event. Uh, we put um, their blood in a test tube. We added a, um, a peptide from a, a, pept a tetanus neoantigen, a peptide that was from tetanus uh, from, a real, from a real patient, put it in the test tube, and you can see that left-hand dot in the upper, right, upper left-hand corner matches to a high level of interferon gamma. This is a torpedo that the cells release to kill a tetanus-infected cell. And if I add a second peptide on the horizontal line at incrementing concentrations, I can completely extinguish the antigen presentation event. And this has been well recognized now. This is a problem in the cancer space where you try to deliver multiple peptides, they compete. And so, the, so you got two problems. The peptides are tiny and they can compete. We saw both those problems at the same time with this dry powder uh, adjuvated microsphere technology. And we do this by making, the, making microspheres the same size as antigen presenting cells. So you can see here there's a yellow peptide and a magenta peptide. We're gonna deliver that to uh, put those in, in, a, in a patient. They, they migrate into cells. And because the spheres are the same size as the cells, you cannot put uh, more than one microsphere in the cell at the same time. We call this size exclusion antigen presentation control. It leads to a smooth, uh, a predictable, a safe antigen presentation event, which can cause T cell expansion against that target. And, um, and this is the patented technology. It's the basis of what we're doing. And we tested it with Ebola virus at the Galveston National Laboratory um, at University of Texas Medical Branch. Now, you heard Dr. Hahn say that uh, the government will, will provide access to, uh, to precious resources for doing work like BSL-4. BSL-4 just means uh, biologic safety containment level four, which is what you have to have. Remember, remember Dustin Hoffman in Outbreak with the, you know, the suits with the, with the tubes in the back with compressed air, the you know, helmets, that's what you have to do to handle these viruses. UTMB Galveston is a great organization to work with. They're available to the civilian sector. They're fee for service. They do a very good job. And, and we work, we've worked with them for free for several years now on filovirus and they're directly accessible to you. You don't need to go to the federal government to do contracts with uh, Trevor Brazel and his group there and they're very, very good. So we studied uh, uh, mice uh, extensively there. Uh, this is just one little 10 mouse cohort, a thousand particle forming units of of Ebola, this is a very, very high dose. Um, C57 black six mice have a natural, um, 
have a natural immunity to some bullet to some extent, so they got, got 80% uh, mortality here. What's interesting is that 100% 100% survival with the vaccinated group. And in fact, if you look at the vaccinated group, the, the girl mice are at the bottom, the male mice are on the top, and you can see that the weights are stable. These mice did not get sick. The vaccinated mice did not get sick, and they didn't die. If you look at the mice that that uh, that survived, the two that survived, they got sick for a while, then survived, the rest died. So this is pretty remarkable. We've never had a failure. We've never had a failure across more than 100 mice with the Ebola vaccine. Not a single dose failed to protect. Why is it that good? How is that even possible? It gets back to this size exclusion antigen presentation control technology I just spoke of. And you can see in the video here in human tissue culture, the black uh, biodegradable microspheres fit one to one, one sphere per cell. And this creates a, a, the illusion of a bigness. We put two adjuvants in there, TLR4 and TLR9. These are just buzzwords for chemicals that push buttons in the immune system to make the body think it has a foreign attack. TLR4 is synthetic bacterial cell membrane, or MPLA. TLR9 is CPG, or bacterial cell, uh, synthetic bacterial, uh, uh, bacterial DNA. Those things uh, trigger the immune system to pay attention to the payload in our sphere. The, the immune system looks at the content, says, wow, there's a peptide in here. It's tiny, but I'm scared because it looks like a bacteria. And you get a T cell expansion uh, at least half the time with a valid antigen presentation event. So we've published this, um, this model in peer reviewed journal. And we have multiple patents protecting it. These are issued patents around the world protecting this very basic idea of a sphere the same size as a cell. Um, we're also applying this in the immuno-oncology space, a quick plug for the space. Uh, you know, immuno-oncology really has been a great interesting area. Checkpoint inhibitors have been marketed widely. You can see them advertised on television. But the problem is those are not specific therapies. I believe the neoantigen space, which is identifying uh, targets on cancer cells that are not present on normal cells and killing those cells is what immuno-oncology should be, safe, potentially inexpensive, and broadly applicable. Our Flovax Flo breast cancer design uh, basically enables us to gene sequence a person, find a tissue that's, or a tumor uh, peptides that are not present on normal tissue, and then rapidly uh, synthesize the vaccine and test it on the individual patient. We plan to do clinical testing uh, later this year. How do you play in this neoantigen sandbox? You have to be able to gene sequence, use co computational tools and AI to find HLA match peptides that are present on tumor and not on and not on uh, normal tissue, and then rapidly develop a vaccine for that patient. Very quickly, we did an experiment in mice. We took normal mouse breast tissue, breast tissue and tumor tissue that we inoculated the mouse with, sequenced it, uh, ran an analysis, determined that the surviving peptide, which is overexpressed in cancer, uh, was there. Took a bunch of surviving peptides, uh, loaded them into the mice, inoculated with tumor. And uh, the green, this is an Ellispot graph. Ellispot is like, it's like an antibody titer, but it's for T cell expansion in a peptide vaccine. You do an antibody titer for an antibody vaccine, you do T cell expansion measurements with Ellispot for a, for a uh, peptide vaccine. The Streckfram Walker is a, is a pretty famous Nature Methods article that gives you a formula for computing whether or not your vaccination was effective. All the green rectangles are effective. The QP19 epitope we gave is the most, was the most uh, well received by these mice. The top is treated, the bottom is controlled. Every mouse is a row. You can see there are uh, nine out of 10 mice survived with the vaccinated group. Uh, uh, the green mice, there are not, eight mice had a good response. The yellow is a poor response to the vaccine. None of the control mice responded to natural targets, so they're not actually actively attacking their tumor. We used a dose of this very aggressive 4T1 cell line to produce cancer in 50% of the mice. And look another way. Bottom is the control. Half the mice have tumor. Tumor weight is to the right. Zero tumor weights on the origin. Uh, in our vaccinated group, uh, all of the mice responding to the vaccine had tumor suppression. So this is a small study, but we're encouraged by it, and we're actually in the clinic now, gene sequencing tissue uh, from women who are coming to the operating room with breast cancer. I was in the operating room with this case last week. Um, we, uh, we got um, uh, we got a sample of normal tissue, sample of, uh, of cancer uh, of tumor from the breast tissue. We go ahead and we freeze that initially on ice in the operating room, then on dry ice in the pathology lab, and then we gene sequence that, and that's in process now. We're doing this in preparation for our planned first clinical dosing trial, which will be, uh, which will be uh, later this year. So we've done some proof principle work in the animals that you saw. We're gene sequencing women coming to the OR. We're also interested in treating 
uh, cervical cancer, which is caused by a virus. So you just heard we have a way to deal with uh, prevention in, in Ebola. Of course, uh, peptide vaccines can also be used therapeutically because they cause T cell expansion that can actually kill an infected cell after the fact. So we've done uh, quite a bit of work with this. We have 10,000 women enrolled in northern China and actually amazingly across three hospitals working with Dr. Yulin Chao, who's a leader in cervical cancer research in China, affiliated with their version of the NIH. And we plan to be dosing those women later this year if we get our GMP facility qualified. Uh, and uh, actually, we may actually manufacture those doses in China. We're checking that out now. And uh, we're going to be testing our Clovax breast cancer in people at the end of this year as well. So that's a brief overview. I want to just say again, you know, how many people know that FreeMind got a shout out in Nature? Does anybody here know that? So FreeMind actually got a shout out in Nature. Nature Journal doesn't really shout out to many private companies, but they mentioned FreeMind uh, a while ago as as somebody to talk to if you're trying to file for federal grants. And we we uh, kind of we stumbled upon them at the Biotechnology Showcase Conference. Uh, here in San Francisco a while ago and have been working with them and I, I just think they're great, they're well organized, they, they don't charge very much really for what they do. I think it's very fair and, and very, and I think also the people we work with there are in Israel and Jerusalem and Tel Aviv, but we really don't notice the time difference. It's about 10 hours later than here, but they don't, they don't insist on early morning TCONs here. They'll talk to us anytime we want. We frequently have conversations later in the day where it's quite late there and, and they don't they don't ever bring that up so it's uh we find that even though they're, they're 10 hours different we don't see that we don't feel that in interaction with them at all they're very easy to deal with and they're very well organized and the people you work with you get the impression they're only working on your project you pick the phone up they instantly know what's going on and they're very helpful and i think the other thing to really mention is the technical details you know even submitting the uh, even submitting the project to the government website is tricky you, not, nothing in this system is you know everything everything in this system requires a little bit of inside knowledge you know what what are the what are the possible problems what are the glitches and there, there's significant issues, and you don't think about them very much. And even sort of pushing, you know, upload can be a problem if you didn't set it up correctly. So the, the FreeMind guys have, been, have really made that look easy for us, uh, seamless for us. And um, we've worked with other consulting firms before, and this is a new experience for us, and we've been very pleased with them. So I, I'm a big supporter of them. I went out of my way to come to this conference because we're doing a lot of a lot of uh, talks and, and things here at J.P. Morgan Week, and I really wanted to come here and talk to you guys because. I think it's. I think this is a really good company, and, and you know you don't you don't always see really good consulting firms that have have everything all together like they do. And I think that they're really a great resource for those of us who are uh, who are accessing this critical government funding for these areas that are underfunded in the private sector. So that's all I have to say. Happy to answer questions. So we met them. Hey Scott, we did we meet them last year at Biotech Showcase? We met them last year at Biotech Showcase. So so 12 months. Yeah. Scott Burkholz is head of our bioinformatics group is in the audience if you have any obscure questions about bioinformatics. Any more questions? Thank you very much for listening.